I'm here today with Representative David Millard, who represents the 109th Legislative District from 2004 to 2022. The 109th District includes parts of Columbia County. So thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you for having me. So let's get started by describing your childhood and family life growing up. Um, if you could just give some background on that. Well, I grew up in a, a working class neighborhood in Bloomsburg, um, right next to the Bloomsburg Fairgrounds. And uh, at that time when I w was a child growing up or a teenager growing up, that there were a lot of uh, factories, local factories, uh, textile mills. My father worked in a silk mill. And that really surrounded uh, the neighborhood that I grew up in. So you got accustomed to the seven o'clock start whistle in the morning and the three o'clock in the afternoon stop whistle. Uh, my house was right along the, the Reading Railroad tracks, literally and uh, you could set your watch by the train when it came through every day, a couple times a day. Okay. Um, so could you describe your education and your career before be coming to the House of Representatives? Well, I graduated from Bloomsburg High School, and uh, then I uh, entered, uh, at the time, Bloomsburg State College. When I started, it was Bloomsburg State College. When I finished 12 and a half years later okay. of doing night school, it was Bloom University. So I. Uh, got to enjoy that transition from a state college to a university. And my working career started uh, working at the construction of the nuclear power plant above Berwick. Mm -hmm. the, the first couple months were spent working for the company that built the, what they called the batch plant. It was a cement plant. Obviously in the construction of a, a nuclear plant, there's just thousands and thousands of yards of concrete that, that would be required. So why haul it in, you know, by the truckload, they, they built their own plant and did it right on site. So a couple months working for the, uh, uh, the batch plant uh, operator and uh, was hired early on um, by Bechtel Power Corporation. I was one of the, uh, within the first 200 people hired and eventually that workforce would grow to a couple of thousand people. So, you know, I thought, well, this is going to be good for five years. And mm -hmm. my goodness, I, w I worked for them two days shy of 10 years. Okay. And was very fortunate by uh, Pennsylvania Power and Light Company, PPL, to be hired by them um, to work another 20 years. So I spent 20 years at the nuclear plant and then 10 years at a fossil plant in Washingtonville. So 30 years total working in the power industry. Okay. Um, so was your family active in politics? If so, did you, obviously you followed in their footsteps or how did you get into politics? Well, uh, for, for two reasons. One, my, my older brother, uh, who is now deceased, he um, was involved in politics mm -hmm. and he actually ran for state representative in Northampton County where he lived. He was not successful in it, okay. but I worked with him as a teenager Mm -hmm. on his campaign and I just absolutely loved it. Love meeting people. I've always enjoyed that. And, you know, just seeing the, the inside workings of, of, of what it entails in a campaign to serve the public. So that really was, was the first bite out of the apple. Then the second was an unfortunate circumstance and that was the, the 1972 flood followed by the 1975 flood. And uh, our home, um, was acquired. It, it was an older home, very much older than um, many of the homes in the community, and it was acquired by eminent domain. And that, that really set the fire under me that, um, you know, you hear the term steamrolled by government entities and everything. Well, that's what I kind of felt. You know, my father was a hard worker. My mother was deceased. She passed away when I was barely a teenager. But I looked at my father, who was just so dedicated, worked 50 years uh, in a textile mill. And, you know, here comes the government saying that because of this flood, we're going to acquire your home. Okay. And I was very active in trying to um, not have that happen unsuccessfully, but, you know, at the end of the day. But, but when you start working uh, on an issue that involves government at all levels, no matter whether you're successful or not, you really learn a lot. And I looked at that as one of uh, life's learned lessons, and that really 
that was just the spark that stayed with me forever to oh. run for office. And I actually ran for office in 1978 and lost. And, you know, that experience stayed with me again. That spark was always there. Mm -hmm. And when I saw an opportunity in 2003, 2004, um, I thought, well, you know, my age was creeping up on me at the time, going to be 50 years old. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, it's now or never. And whatever project I undertake, I'm in uh, for, the, for the whole duration. For the long haul. Got it. So um, what influenced you then to become a Republican? Was your family Republican or was that something you made on your own decision? Actually, my family was a Democrat. Okay. And there were only two Republicans in the family. Uh, my older brother who ran unsuccessful for state representative and myself. And, uh, you know, again, reading the newspapers. Uh, when I grew up, we didn't have a TV. So you did a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. and. You know, all the, all the reading I did, I was becoming very knowledgeable about every level of government, what they were doing. And I just found out that, you know, I was a hardworking guy and, and I believed in, in the principles of uh, not being over-regulated for businesses because our community was no different than others. Mm -hmm. A lot of mom and pop businesses and you got to know the owners and conversations with them, some of the challenges that they faced and I think it was just, uh, you know, a combination of all those things that, you know, when I signed up to vote, I thought Republican is for me. All right. Interesting. That's why we asked that question. Um, moving into your campaigning. So you actually ran in a special election. I did. So could you talk about your first campaign and what that journey was like to get to the House? My first campaign was uh, 58 days uh, from early in the morning till late at night knocking on doors. And uh, in, in the course of... Um, the special election and the re-election, mm -hmm. the day of my special election was the first day, ironically, to circulate petitions for the full two-year term. Okay. So in, in the course of, um, we're gonna say 10 months here, I, I knocked on 23,000 doors. I knocked on 14,000 in 58 days. Mm -hmm. And then after taking the oath of office, of course, you're you know, you, you have to perform the duties of your office, which limits the time you can knock on sure. doors. But uh, in the first uh, special election, I took a leave of absence from my workplace at the power plant and dedicated that to meeting people one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. So other campaigns then after that, do you have any memorable campaign stories or any experiences you'd like to share? Well, you know, it, meeting people, there's just tons of stories when you meet people one-on-one. -on -one. But I, I found out how gracious and how embracing people are. When you're knocking on a door and they're sitting down to have their evening meal and they invite you in to join them, there's nothing more welcoming than that. Or yeah. uh, as time went on and you served in office, when people told you, you helped me with this or that, you know, I always told my staff that um, we may not be able to solve every problem when people walk in the door, but if we can, and we can allow them to leave the office knowing that we're going to work on it, give them a good night's rest. That's part of what our job is. We've, we've done our job to that point. And then, of course, the rest is to, to get the issue across the finish line. But memorable things, um, you know, I, I wore out a couple pair of shoes. Okay. <laughs> that was pretty memorable. Um, most, for the most part, people were very nice. However, uh, in politics, sometimes families, as, as you questioned me earlier, what, you know, uh, um, was the motivation for me to, to register Republican, some people are deeply entrenched in, in what their politics are. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to, to make the statement that I didn't have a couple doors slammed in my face, but, but I took those as a learning experience, not a battle scar. I thought, you know what, um, what can I do to change that person's mind? And mm -hmm. I... Um, always tried to to look at it that way that if if somebody has a disagreement how about we look at the things we agree on yeah and work from there yeah very true so obviously you liked the meeting people part of the campaigning but did you enjoy campaigning as a whole I know you have a lot of fundraising to do and all that um, so did you enjoy that or not really I, I did I enjoyed every moment of it um, you know some people you you can have town halls but some people are more apt and more comfortable in, in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Mm -hmm. So that's the value of going door to door. 
And I've never gone through a campaign, and I've been through many of them, that I didn't go door to door. Okay. I've always continued to do that. If I'm in a community and I've, I've got one meeting in the morning and a couple hour break till the afternoon, I'm out. I'm out mm -hmm. knocking on doors or visit a local restaurant and, and sit down. But don't just sit down and have a meal. Engage the, the individuals, you know, try to have a conversation. And, and in doing so, in, there are many, com many meetings in many communities, but in doing just that, the blueprint for success, you, it allows you to put your finger on the pulse of what's going on in that community. All of us as representatives have many communities in our legislative district. And although they share a lot of things in common, there are things that are unique to each of those communities. And it's important for you to embody all of it. You know, that, that's mm -hmm. what makes you uh, an effective legislator. And that's been my motto, embody it and uh, try to do your best to you know, help those communities. Okay. Um, so did your family assist in your campaigns? Um, how did your public service impact them as a whole? They did. My, my family was very supportive. Uh, they worked polls and uh, my children worked polls. Um, they were um, delivering things during election day to other poll workers. Uh, my children were, were barely teenagers when I sought public mm -hmm. office. So they, they immediately grew up in a fishbowl. Yeah. And I'm proud to say that they now, when they go to vote, they are very informed voters. Mm -hmm. So if you are a candidate knocking on their door, it won't be a one minute uh, hello and goodbye greeting because they're gonna have questions for you. They're very engaged. Yeah, okay. So you got sworn in in the special election. Um, usually that's the most memorable swearing in ceremony. If you wanna talk about that swearing in, um, or if any other really memorable swearing in ceremonies. Well, it was very memorable. Uh, first of all, with having your supporters come to Harrisburg mm -hmm. to uh, witness that. Uh, the, the judge who swore me in um, was an individual I knew from high school and lived two blocks up the street from me. So you, you're bringing together family and friends and community to do that. That's pretty special. I wanted to get sworn in on February 10th, which okay. is my birthday. Oh. <laughs> but that happened to be the anniversary of the Speaker of the House. So I was sworn in on February the 9th. Okay. Elected January 27th, sworn in on the 9th. Okay. Do you have any other memorable swearing-in ceremonies as much as your first one or? Everyone was special. You know, when you walk into that chamber, and you see uh, other members who are there for the first time because every two-year cycle there are new faces and to look at their family standing so proud and and my family of course standing proud as well but you in your heart you know the the exuberance that they're feeling knowing that they're they're in in engaged in a historic moment mm -hmm. they're going to be sworn in as a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, and that's pretty special. Yeah. You know, throughout history, and again, we're the oldest serving legislative body, I think that we're probably just a little over 13,000 um, individuals elected to the House of Representatives in a couple hundred years, and what does that equate to overall in our population? Millions of people. Mm -hmm. To think that you are one of a select few out of millions has to impact you, it certainly impacted me. Yeah. And every day that I sit in that chamber when we're in session, I literally reach up and pinch myself on the cheek. I look at the fresco above my seat, I look at all the surroundings in that house, and I, I say to myself, how did somebody of such a meager upbringing economically um, have the, the honor, the opportunity to serve in this august body? Yeah. And, you know, my, my mission has been very simple, and that is to be the voice of the folks back home. Not be my voice here, but to be their voice. And I've lived that every day. Okay, that's a good segue then, because now we're going to talk about your district. Um, describe what makes it unique and what makes the, what are the issues important to your constituents? Well, my, my district is a mix. It's uh, agricultural. Um, you know, we're, we're in the T-bone part of the state. If you put a T-bone steak on a map of Pennsylvania, that's rural PA. Mm -hmm. That's where my district is. 
So my district feeds the other portions of the state with the agriculture. Secondly, is that it's unique in that I have an institution of higher learning, Bloomsburg University. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a difference in the individuals who work in the factories and of course the, the professionals. Geisinger uh, Hospital is not in my district, it's to my south, but many of their professionals that work there live in my district, mm -hmm. we're that close. So it's a mix of the working class, it's a mix of, of professionals, of, of every profession that you can imagine, and it's an oasis in that we have an institution of higher learning that provides an opportunity right in your own backyard for a higher education. So all of those things together describe my district. In addition to that, the geography is, is that we have the beauty of nature. Mm -hmm. We've got a, a, a lot of public lands available. And you know, rural PA, it's not uh, uh, 20 or 30 or 40 story skyscrapers, obviously. It, it's a, a very pleasant, aesthetic scene when you when you look out the countryside and you see the the, the patchwork uh, you know the, the the patchwork quilt of of crops being raised and crop rotation and animals it's just so so pleasing to the eye it's so uh, calming mm -hmm. and you know there's serious business obviously but but it's just it, it, I call it the, the the best place on earth yeah I know you've also been involved with the Bloomsburg Fair yes. for a long time. If you want to talk about your role with the fair, because it's in your district, so that's probably important to mention as well. Well, as I mentioned to you early on, I, I grew up in the neighborhood of the mm -hmm. Bloomsburg Fair, two doors from the fair. I served on that board successfully for 26 years. And the Bloomsburg Fair, again, promotes so many things in the community. It's The fair itself is an economic engine, as are the other 100 plus fairs in, in Pennsylvania. But the other unique thing is that uh, they promote the future of agriculture, 4-H, FFA, junior achievement. Um, we need this networking. We, we need these individuals to be our future to ensure our food, food quality that we all consume every day. And you know, there's no vacation on a farm. It's a seven day mm -hmm. a week in involvement. And to see our youth stepping forward to take over those uh, legacy farms, those century farms, the family farms, and continue that uh, is what the, the Bloomsburg Fair promotes. Now the other half of it, of course, is commercial. Mm -hmm. And the commercial end of it um, actually pays the bills for the non-commercial end of it. But the commercial end is unique in that they, again, are mom and pop businesses for the most part. And benevolent organizations, every community has benevolent organizations, all of whom have to do some type of fundraising to meet their mission statement. Mm -hmm. And the Bloomsburg Fair is the site of over 900 vendors on the fair, many of whom are benevolent organizations, whether it's the Lions, Kiwanis, Elks, church stands, or, or the list goes on and on. Those dollars that they raise at the fair for whatever it is that they're selling, whether it's food or another product, stays right in their community. Mm -hmm. it, it fills a void in their community. It fills a need in their community. And um, you know, the, the, the fact that the Bloomsburg Fair is one of the largest fairs in PA and draws over 400,000 people in, in an eight day stretch basically, um, obviously there's a lot of traffic there. Um, people walking around, they get hungry or you know, something catches their eye. So they, these benevolent organizations as well as the mom and pop organizations all benefit from it. Then you have the outside of the fairgrounds um, real estate. A lot of those individuals park cars fairway. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to walk any further than what they have to to get in a venue. So they capitalize on that. So that's, uh, you know, um, little entrepreneurs, if you will, that one week a year, they're able to capitalize on, on something and, and, and make money. And I've heard it many times. Um, I've heard it a thousand times if I've heard it once from uh, individuals who do park cars that, well, this is my, my heating expense for the winter. Yeah. And think about that, you know, typically in any given household, paying your expenses through the winter is a lot higher than, than during the, the warmer months. So to, to, to make that goal of, of having those funds available is, is a big impact in any family's budget. Okay, excellent. So, 
let's go to um, your legislation. So I have a few things I have here that you successfully passed, but is there any legislation you'd like to discuss that things you are really glad that they passed or things you wish would have been enacted? Well, there, there are two uh, that, that come to the forefront. One, of course, is the uh, dedicated funding for fares mm -hmm. out of, out of the, the budget. Um, used to be that I'd have to advocate every year for fare funding. And again, there are over 100 fares in, in Pennsylvania, and I've explained to you what, what really mm -hmm. their mission is yeah. and, and the importance of what it is to all of us. So to have dedicated funding out of the gaming funds was very important. Uh, gaming funds, you know, involve uh, some of the facilities, uh, our, our racetrack facilities. It's the equine industry, which, which is, is a major industry in PA. And, you know, to, to feed those horses is, is another entity that enters in with the hay and the straw and everything else. So that having been said, I was very proud to get that dedicated funding that, um, you know, as our economy is up and down, so is our state budget, sometimes dollars are scarce. But yeah. when you have dedicated dollars, you as an individual entity have knowledge that those dollars are forthcoming and you can continue to do what your mission is without interruption. Secondly was getting something in the transportation bill regarding a prevailing wage for townships. Um, our Commonwealth is a home to thousands of uh, small townships and villages and, you know, uh, we all drive the roads, they all need to have some maintenance other than state roads, which mm -hmm. is, is separate or federal. And, you know, prevailing wage was really carving into the ability of these um, supervisors at, at the very, very local level to do a good job of maintaining the roads. Yes, they had the, the uh, uh, liquid fuels funds, the dirt and gravel road program, but there were expenses outside of that that, that they had a need for to do maintenance. And a lot of times the prevailing wage um, made some of those projects unaffordable for them to do, or at the very least postpone them. It didn't impact the large projects across mm -hmm. the state, yeah. but it was very helpful to those small townships to service their community and their constituents. So I was very proud of that. Okay. Is there any legislation that you're working on right now that you hope passes before you retire th in November? Well, we're working on uh, an, an MRI uh, imaging bill okay. uh, that involves several professionals and we're, we're almost at the finish line uh, you know looking at um, less than a dozen legislative days left supposedly mm -hmm. on the calendar uh, it's critical it's in the Senate we're trying to to, to get whatever concerns they have um, you know ironed out get it voted on get it back and uh, you know move on all of us uh, at some point uh, require health care mm -hmm. and our expectation is that when we walk through the front doors of any clinic or facility or hospital that we get the best care available to us and what this bill will do is, is provide another notch in that professional quality care. Okay. So what do you think is your strength as a legislature, as a legislator, excuse me? I think the ability to, uh, to work, uh, you know, uh, across party lines, to have the ability to communicate, um, you know, with the folks back home and bring their voice here and try to work on their issues. But, but I think communication is, is a definite skill. And, you know, if you, if you come in every day and greet everybody with a smile and, and try to engage people in conversation, um, I think that that puts everybody at ease for the serious issues that, that need to be discussed. And at the end of the day, you may not get everything that you want, but if you are able to understand other points of view and extract those items that you can get, mm -hmm. I think that it's a win. Okay. Um, so moving on to uh, relationships within the legislature, did you have any mentors when you started your career in the House? Well, certainly uh, the individual for whom I replaced in the House when he became Senator was John Gordner. Okay. Um, he definitely has been, been a mentor to me. You know, no matter who we are, what position we serve, everybody has a first day. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a second day and every day thereafter. And those first days that you have are very critical because you're very apprehensive about different things. You're learning, you're in a learning experience. Even though you may have a lot in your skill set to do the job, it's still a different environment for you that you have to become accustomed to. 
and to have somebody who is skilled guide you and you know just give you pointers along the way which Senator Gordner not only on the first day has done but we've had a continued working relationship that has greatly benefited our representative area mm -hmm. and I think that that's invaluable and also you know all of my fellow members um, you you forge friendships on both sides of the aisle let's face it not every Republican represents a rural area not mm -hmm. every Democrat represents a rural area but there are some that do so right there is something that is common to each of you and you you build upon that commonality forge those friendships and those friendships are, are valuable in so many ways first in understanding what your issue what your need is that's unique to your area mm -hmm. secondly that you want to obviously get enough votes to have something pass and my goodness if you can get bipartisan mm -hmm. support that's really key to a lot of things here okay did you take on a mentor role for anyone I know you said you get along with both sides but is there anyone in particular you really took under your wing when they started well I I have taken on a mentor role with with other members who I've shared the office uh, suite with and uh, you know always tried to um, point out the do's and the don'ts to them in any two-year legislative session there there are in excess of 4,000 proposals mm -hmm. they all get assigned to a committee maybe a thousand of those are discharged from committee even less than that get voted on on the house floor so there are some proposals that um, are extreme uh, there are some that are you know middle of the road or moderate so anybody who was a new member um, that that cared I you know reached out to them and said look when you get these proposals I'm happy to explain them to you what would be maybe advantageous for you to sign on to some maybe not mm -hmm. so advantageous um, you know nobody wants a, a four inch headline above the fold in the newspaper that's negative mm -hmm. you know we all want our picture on the front page of doing good things that's why we're here and how do you prevent those other things well um, you have to have a little institutional knowledge to know yeah um, most are here for uh, the good purpose of representing folks back home but you know in reality there are extremes on on the far left the far right and uh, you just have to be aware of, of what you're looking at okay so your committees I know you're a chair right now um, is that your favorite committee you've worked on do you have others that you really enjoyed working on it is I've served on the house tourism and recreational development committee since day one mm -hmm. and my experience at the fair definitely tourism related um, you certainly want to draw people in from outside of your sure. geographic area which we were successful in doing so that was a perfect fit for me and the interesting thing of that committee is traveling all across the state as I've done and learning what other areas of the state do what their successes are mm -hmm. what their failures are not everything works in every given area of the state so you have to pick and choose those items that do work but wow I've seen a lot of unique mm -hmm. ideas and we've tried to embrace them locally and we've had success with them as I'm sure that other members of the committee have had in their respective areas. I served on agricultural uh, committee f uh, since day one until a couple years ago when I became chair. Mm -hmm. And now I've served on, on the uh, judicial committee. Uh, a couple other committees I served on, professional licensure, children and youth, fish and game, all of which gave me a, a pretty good experience. Um, I, appropriations was uh, a committee I served on again until I became a chairman mm -hmm. appropriations committee you learn so much um, you you build a network of individuals working as deputy secretaries in all of our government agencies that networking that um, friendly working relationship that you establish with with those agencies is of such a benefit to your mm -hmm. your respective legislative district it, it just uh, it's unbelievable I mean when people walk into your office um, typically as a legislative office you are not the office of first resort mm -hmm. you're the office of last resort yeah and you have to recognize the fact that if they're coming to you they're probably frustrated because of the red tape in any given agency so you've got to be able to get the scissors out and cut that red tape mm -hmm. and serving on appropriations provided that network 
to be able to cut that red tape. Yeah. So I've always tried to, to use that to the benefit of my constituents. That's an excellent point. Okay. So um, what made you decide not to run for re-election to the House? Age 70. <laughs> okay. A <laughs> couple months shy of age 70, but um, I knew that when I started my working career that um, when, when I was age 70 that that would be the, the, the point in time for me, the age that I would say, well, my working career is, is done. So I leave on good terms. Mm -hmm. I leave on my terms. I leave in good health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing as we age is that there are probably things we want to do. I know there are things I'd like to do. Um, you know, every calendar, every publication, many articles about national parks, state parks, things I want to see. And quite frankly, I want to be able to do it while I'm ambulatory on my own. Yeah. I don't want to see it from a wheelchair. I want to see it standing tall. Yeah. So I really, those are the things, uh, you know, the other is family. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very important. And my, my grandchildren, uh, I have several, they range uh, you know, many ages from almost age 40 down to three or four years old. And um, the younger ones will probably soon be involved in different activities in school. And uh, I want them to know that grandpap is available to, to be there and be supportive. So family um, mm -hmm. and traveling, uh, those are certainly things I'm looking forward to doing. Mm -hmm. But my age, age 70, was just... Uh, a point in time in my life when I said, this is it. Okay. So um, what will you miss most about being in the house? I'll miss the camaraderie. You mm -hmm. know, as much as uh, there are debates on the house floor about everything, it's the individual passion of every representative that I serve with that I've seen who's advocating for their constituents, their district. Now, there are other issues off to the side, too, but you know, that, that working relationship and seeing that we truly are all here for the same mission, to create a better quality of life, not only in our community, but the state as a whole. So I've embodied that, and mm -hmm. I, I thought, you know, this, this is wonderful that when everybody is working toward making something better. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that. Of course, there are a lot of elements that enter into that. Sometimes when the dollars aren't flowing to support programs, then you have to prioritize, and that's why we're here, mm -hmm. to do that prioritization. But I think overall, at the end of the day, it's those friendships that I've forged on both sides of the aisle that although my service career actively will end here on November 30th, those friendships, they'll continue forever for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, two more questions then. We'll just do, what is your advice for current members or members who are going to be coming in for next session? My advice is to um, seek those commonalities. Get to know your fellow members on both sides of the aisle. Um, don't be adversarial. Try to work together. Mm -hmm. Find out what you agree on. You're not going to agree on everything. But, you know, a positive, a first foot forward is to find out what do we agree on. And what does this mean in my community? I've looked at every piece of legislation. I tried to put a name and a face behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, well, how, how would this affect so-and-so in my community? And we're all here to make an informed vote. How do we get there? Well, there's hearings, there's debate. At the end of the day, you have to push the button, yes or no. But if you do that in a fashion, having been informed, about that and you make an informed decision that you can back up and stand behind, then I think you've served your community well. But how do you do that? You have to engage in those conversations, forge those friendships, and just move forward. Okay. And then my last question for you then is, um, how do you want your tenure here to be remembered? Listen, I, I just want to be remembered as a hard worker for the folks back home. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add or any other points that you think we missed? Nope, I think we've covered everything. Okay. And, um, you know, again, it's just been my honor, my privilege to serve here that the people back home have sent me back time after time again. And, and really, when you look at that, that's, that's just such a warmth in your heart. And never, never just take it for granted. Mm -hmm. 
you know, just appreciate the honor that's been b bestowed upon you. I know that I do. You know, I, I, I again grew up poor, but to have this honor to do this, you know, I, I sometimes say, my goodness, Dave, how'd you get to, to do this? Yeah. And, and I just appreciate it every day. Well, thank you so much, Representative Millar. This was a true pleasure, and uh, good luck in your retirement. Thank you. <laughs> thank appreciate you. that.